Okay. We'll just start in a couple of minutes, Dr. Brad. Sure, no problem. And your family is doing well? Yeah, all good. Are they, uh, I'm sure everybody's ready to get back to normal life or do people want to stay at home longer even? I don't think so. We are so used to busy life then. Right now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. You're so out of touch doing uh, such things. It feels so odd. I have not operated for quite some time now. <laughs> Right, right, right. <laughs> yeah. What type of exposure do the residents have to blepharoplasty during their training? Uh, they get to observe, but uh, they, they don't get to do uh, blepharoplasty, but they get to observe. Okay. And mainly upper blepharoplasty or a little bit of lower blepharoplasty as well? Uh, both. Both, yeah. Good evening, one and all. Uh, uh, I heartily welcome uh, Dr. Bradford William Lee for uh, today's class on blepharoplasty. Dr. Bradford William Lee is an assistant professor specializing in Bascom Palmer Eye Institute, Palm Beach, Florida. He is a board certified member of ASOPRS. He obtained a degree from biochemical sciences initially from Harvard University and then uh, health policy planning and financing from the London School of Economics. Later, he attended the St Stanford Medical School where he received research scholarship to study eye care delivery. And that's when he came to Arvind and we got acquainted with him. Dr. Lee really completed his ophthalmology residency at Baskin Palmer and went on to complete the prestigious AS OPRS accredited fellowship at San Diego's Shiley Eye Institute under the, the one and only Don Kikawa. Dr. Lee has presented several research and has taught his courses in several national and international meetings. He has authored numerous peer-reviewed publications and book chapters, including chapters in the best-selling video atlas of oculofacial plastic and reconstructive surgery. At Baskin Palmer, Dr. Lee has an active role in residency educations and in training oculoplastic fellows. His clinical practice currently focuses on thyroid eye disease, cosmetic eyelid and facial surgery, reconstructive eyelid surgery, Botox, dermal fillers, laser skin regeneration, apart from the array of tumors. Over to Dr. Lee. Hi there. Thank you so much for the kind invitation to be part of your lecture series. I know this has been a very challenging and uh, unnerving time for so many people, and I've been following the news on India, and um, I just want you to know that I'm uh, certainly thinking of all my friends in India at, and at Aravind, and uh, I'm glad to hear that things will be sort of returning to normal life relatively soon. So I'm going to share my screen here. Uh, let's see. And certainly, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to enter them in the chat. And at the end, we'll have time to go through them. Sure. OK, so um, I'm going to cover a few topics today uh, that in include both upper blepharoplasty, lower blepharoplasty, uh, some tips on how to enhance your technique, um, and then also how to prevent certain com complications. I want to just start by saying that Arvin has been a very, very uh, near and dear part of uh, my experience as an ophthalmologist and as a physician. Um, during medical school, when I was uh, studying at Stanford, I first began uh, doing research at Aravind after my first year of medical school, where I was mainly working with the glaucoma team. 
and I spent six weeks at Arvin Kombator with Dr. Satyan, Dr. Ganesh, uh, but also with advice from Dr. Venkatesh, Alan Robin, um, and our work that summer resulted in a, a publication in the Archives of Ophthalmology. Then at the end of medical school, I had such a good experience that I actually went back for another six to eight weeks or so, um, this time working a little bit with Mr. Dulce Raj with LICO, and then also uh, doing a follow-up study on glaucoma counseling interventions, which also um, you know, resulted in a publication in the American Journal of Ophthalmology. And then uh, last but not least, uh, I had the pleasure of hosting Dr. Jaya for a clinical observership at Baskin Palmer just a, a few years ago. And this has resulted in no publications, but a priceless friendship and memories. And today, me being here with you. So today we're going to be talking about age-related changes of the eyelids, discussing the evaluation of the patient with droopy upper lids, offering tips to improve outcomes uh, and prevent complications with upper blepharoplasty as well as with lower blepharoplasty. So let's start first of all by talking a little bit about youthful upper eyelids. Uh, in this picture over here, you can see this patient has no significant extra upper eyelid skin. Uh, there is something called tarsal platform show, which is this area where many women put on eyeshadow. You are supposed to be seeing a little bit of this area normally. She has some nice fullness to the preoponeurotic area. It's not extremely hollow or sunken. Um, there's no significant bulging of fat on the upper medial eyelid. And then the brow configuration is nice and arched and full. Contrast that to uh, two patients whose upper lids have aged in different ways. So in this first patient, you'll notice that there's significant excess skin. And again, suddenly you're not, no longer able to see that area of tarsal plot from show. So a lot of my female patients say, I can't see that area when I put on makeup anymore. So it, I, I don't even bother to do it anymore. Um, and then they are also bothered oftentimes by a little bit of puffiness of the medial fat prolapse over here. Now in this patient, you can see how eyelids can age differently. This patient is severely hollowed up here or what we call superior sulcus hollowing. There's flattening and deflation of the brow con configuration um, and then Although there's no extra folds of skin, uh, this is because the skin is taken up or is invaginated into this hollow space up above. So there is extra skin, but it's not folding over her, her lashes because it's taken up into that empty space up there. So let's talk a little bit about um, how we evaluate a patient who comes in saying, you know, they have quote unquote droopy upper lids. Um, I always tell patients, you have to look for three things. You have to look at um, the dermatomyelitis, but you also have to look at the brow configuration because this can cause, brow ptosis can cause secondary dermatomyelitis um, and lateral hooding. And then of course you wanna look for true eyelid ptosis. Um, as ophthalmologists, what separates us from plastic surgeons is that we are trained to protect the eye and to make sure that we don't compromise uh, the ocular surface or any cause any other complications from doing eyelid surgery. And so I always talk to patients and evaluate them for dry eye syndrome, if they're symptomatic and how bad it is. I talk to them if they, if they have concomitant cataracts, um, what I tell them is that, you know, you should probably do the cataract surgery first if you know you would, would like to have it within the next few months, because in about maybe 5% of patients, they can develop ptosis after uh, cataract surgery due to the speculum stretching the levator muscle. So this way, if that were to occur, I can fix that at the same time as their blepharoplasty. Um, if they've had prior ocular surgeries like trabeculectomy or um, you know, a corneal transplant, I generally tell them I'd like to be a little bit more cautious because we don't want blood exposure, nor do we want decompensation of their grafts. Um, and then I also certainly ask them about any other uh, eye or eyelid surgeries that they've had before, uh, because this does factor into, um, you know, what has happened to their orbicularis oculi muscle 
whether it's been weakened by Botox injections or whether they've had weakness for other reasons like due to a facial nerve palsy. Uh, and then finally, some of my patients are interested in aesthetics and others just wanna see better. But if they are interested in aesthetics, then I try to get a sense of what's bothering them and how we can best fix that. So when we're thinking about blepharoplasty, there's three tissues that we're working on, um, skin, muscle, and fat. And I think we have to think about each part of the surgery um, and you know, be very precise and uh, intentional about what we're doing. So um, some of the most common issues that I see uh, in blepharoplasty is in terms of the skin, um, a lot of times people don't do the markings in a way that fully corrects the, um, the lateral hooding that occurs beyond the lateral canthus. Uh, with regards to the orbicularis oculi muscle, uh, a lot of times the problem is that people are over aggressive in removing that muscle. Um, and this obviously can result in weakness in the enclosure of the eye, lack of thalmos, impairing the blink reflex um, or the, the completeness of the blink response. And finally, the improper management of fat. And that could be taking out too much in the wrong place or not taking enough in the right place. And then of course, you know, like I said, if you, you have to look at those three things that the brow position, whether they have ptosis and whether they have extra skin and fat. And if you fail to address the ptosis and brow ptosis, patients can have a partial correction, but may not be completely happy with the, the overall final outcome. So let's start with a few cases. So this is an example of a patient who came into me. She's a fairly elderly patient in her late 80s, but in Palm Beach, Florida, I have quite a number of senior patients who are still you know, wanting to see well and wanting to look good. So this patient uh, had actually just had a prior blepharoplasty um, a few years back and presents with um, lateral, she's bothered by this extra flap of skin here. So I don't know if any of the residents want to take a stab at this, but um, if you'd like, you can unmute yourself and let us know what you see that's going on in this picture. Does anyone want to give it a shot? Uh, Dr. Brad, uh, all are uh, muted by us, and they oh, will have their uh, questions. Uh, uh, oh, the okay, I'll just, I'll just go through over here. So what you can see here is that she does have a little bit of uh, lower, she has a little bit of brow ptosis, because you can see that her brow is actually sitting below the supraorbital ridge over here. And this is a very common cause for why patients have lateral hooding. Um, one of my mentors said, if you see any type of lateral hooding beyond the lateral canthus, you, it's almost inevitably due to some degree of brow ptosis. Um, and so what I think happened was that even though she had extra skin removed uh, with her prior blepharoplasty, the incisions were not, not enough skin was taken laterally. And so she had some residual hooding there. This is the area where that she was bothered by. And what I did was I, did a uh, repeat blepharoplasty and extended uh, new, created new incisions that extended further laterally to take that extra skin. So the mistakes are not a failure to address the brow ptosis. And in an 87 year old woman, they don't want a dramatic brow lift. So you may not do that, but you can take a little bit of more of that extra skin. Um, a lot of it has to do with the markings, like I told you. Um, and so the idea would be to at least discuss and consider the option of a brow lift procedure. Um, and then another technique for addressing lateral brow ptosis is to excise a little bit of the lateral orbicularis because orbicularis is actually a brow depressor muscle. That's why if I'm closing my eyes here and I squeeze my eyes closed, it pulls the brow downward. So if you conservatively weaken the orbicularis laterally, that can help with the lateral brow ptosis. Um, and then like we talked about, consider maybe a slightly more aggressive skin removal laterally. 
Kate. So this is the patient after her second, you know, touch up blepharoplasty, and you can see that lateral hooding is better. I didn't do anything really to the to the brow position. Definitely not a direct brow lift. I may have done like a little supportive stitch internally. So let's look at another common complication. Uh, this is a something that happen, I happen to see in uh, patients who I, I jokingly say have the too much plastic surgery syndrome. Uh, and <laughs> these are patients who are ex extremely aesthetically inclined and have not had good cosmetic surgery and sometimes have had too much. So this is another se very senior patient in her 80s who comes in complaining of severe dry eyes. And in talking to her a little bit more, she's already had two blepharoplasties by other people. She's had a lot of other facial cosmetic surgery. Um, she's had some revisional eyelid surgery, you know, to correct her prior blepharoplasties. Uh, at some point she had the, some tar limited lateral tarsophies due to exposure keratopathy. And to make matters worse, she's had a whole bunch of corneal surgeries, which we know uh, denervates the cornea and worsens dry eye. And in the picture here, you can see it looks like she has a little bit of ectropion, a little bit of a, maybe a pyogenic granuloma from maybe her lower lid retraction repairs. And then I, when I ask her to close her eyes gently, this is what it looks like. So you can see that she has lag ophthalmos and a somewhat poor Bell's reflex. So patients can actually develop a degree of paralytic lag ophthalmos following multiple eyelid surgeries and blepharoplasties. Because every time you make an incision into the eyelid and cut into the orbicularis muscle, and definitely when you excise a bunch of orbicularis muscle with skin, um, you can weaken that muscle and cut the the motor nerves. So one of my friends and colleagues in Brazil, Midori Osaki, did a study looking at uh, patients who had had skin and muscle removed with blepharoplasty as opposed to just skin alone without disruption of the orbicularis muscle. And what she found was that there, was, um, there were more postoperative complaints and symptoms. Patients were temporarily worse aesthetically in the short term, meaning they had more swelling, more bruising. In the, in the end, they didn't notice any final difference in the aesthetic outcome. But this is, these were patients done by her, so she was intentionally not overdoing it. Um, but I think the ideal management of the orbicularis muscle, again, we should be very intentional about what tissues we're excising. So if it's really a patient um, who mainly just has extra skin, is a little bit hollow, is elderly and with dry eyes, definitely skin only blepharoplasty because you don't need to excise muscle to really have an improved aesthetic outcome. Uh, if patients have very heavy brows and very full upper lids, sometimes I'll do a limited orbicularis muscle resection. Um, so I'll take a little bit of muscle with my skin excision and that can sometimes just help a little bit with the bulkiness of the upper lids. And then finally, if they have just lateral brow ptosis, like we talked about, it is okay to take a little bit of the lateral orbicularis to help pick up the lateral brow just a little bit. So finally, we've talked about, uh, we've already talked about the skin, the fat, uh, skin and the muscle. So now let's talk about fat because um, patients can be very bothered by the appearance of this fat. Uh, and I think the mistake here is suboptimal fat management. So not taking enough where it needs to go and maybe taking too much where it doesn't need to be removed. So this is an example of a patient you know, with quite a bit of puffiness around the eyelids, upper lids and lower lids. Uh, this is another patient that we talked about earlier who she actually hasn't had any prior eyelid surgery, but this is also not a youthful look. So you know, having hollowing in this preoponeurotic fat region is a sign of aging, as is this medial fat prolapse. And when she looks up, you can actually see how this area bulges, bulges out and uh, is not attractive per se. There's another example of a patient with significant medial fat prolapse and a little bit of xanthalasma. Um, and then this is another patient who actually came in for a blepharoplasty evaluation asking if 
more, uh, this little bit of skin should be removed, but she couldn't put a finger on it, but she was actually really bothered by this hollowing in the preoponeurotic fat area. Um, so rather than excising skin, I talked to her about actually volumizing that area to address her aesthetic concerns. Um, and then you can see down below, this is after no surgery was performed, just filler to the, to the superior sulcus area. And you can see how it actually made a more of a youthful complex, reduced that um, pretarsal show here and addressed the superior sulcus hollowing. So my mentor and, and, and colleagues at UC San Diego did a very nice study uh, a while back, looking at a hundred different patients um, at various decades throughout their life to see how the fat pads changed with aging. And then they gra graded the fat pads from you know, zero to three based on how hollow or full the eyelids were. And what they found was that as patients aged, um, the average central fat pad, the preoponeurotic pre fat pad, overall that tended to become more hollow with age and decade of life, whereas the medial fat pad tended to become more prominent. And uh, as we talked about, there are individual variations. Everybody's eyelids may vary a little bit differently, but overall, um, this was the trend for there to be hollowing of the central fat pad, but increasing prolapse of the medial fat prolapse, medial fat pad. So in trying to avoid this mistake of suboptimal fat management, um, I always generally recommend doing a conservative debulking of the medial fat prolapse because nobody wants uh, puffiness in this area from an aesthetic standpoint, but you really want to avoid ag aggressive removal of the preoponeurotic fat pad because that can age people and hollow them and make them look more skeletonized. So this was our patient that I showed you before after a upper lower blepharoplasty just to conservatively debulk that fat in the upper and lower lids. So now we'll move into the second segment of my lecture where I'll talk a little bit about customized blepharoplasty and how to evaluate and tailor your surgery for the patient who, who is interested in lower lid rejuvenation. So let's talk a little bit about aging and as opposed to youthful lower eyelids. And these are you know, a couple celebrities who demonstrate some nice characteristics of a youthful lower eyelid. So typically pa these patients will have vertically short lower eyelids. Studies have shown that as eyelids age, the lower lid appears vertically elongated. Uh, another thing is that we, the youthful lower lid does not have visible fat prolapse or no bulging of the fat. There's a relatively smooth junction and transition between the eyelid and the cheek. There's no significant hollowing um, beneath the eyelids and the fat prolapse. And here are four different examples of patients who have different types of aging of the lower lids. Uh, this patient has prominent fat prolapse. This patient has a little bit of prolapse, but significant deflation and loss of volume in the lower eyelid and cheek region. This patient has a little bit of eyelid retraction and a lot of extra skin here in addition to fat prolapse. Um, and you can see all, it, it can really vary by patient. This is uh, the same patient with, when no surgery has been performed. And it just goes to show that how patients see their eyes in different lighting situations. So this is a patient who, uh, there's, who is, the photo was taken with a bright flash to overexpose things. Um, so this generally makes things look a little bit better, but a lot of times patients live in conditions where we have overhead lighting. And when you have overhead lighting, it really demonstrates the contours and uh, the, the hollows and the shadowing beneath the prolapse. So when patients talk about the dark circles beneath their eyes, a lot of times these dark circles are not due to pigment problems or hyperpigmentation, but it has to do with the volumetrics and surface topography of the lower eyelids. And the dark circle is this shadowing beneath the fat prolapse over here. 
So one of the key anatomical landmarks that I like to talk about is the arcus marginalis and this double concavity, which is formed by the fat prolapse as well as the cheek contour. And if you look at a side view of an anatomical drawing, I really say this arcus marginalis is important because this is the insertion of the orbital septum onto the inferior orbital rim. And it, the septum, of course, holds back the orbital fat, which tends to prolapse over time. So you have the prolapse, the insertion on the rim, and then you get that concavity here. So what we're trying to do is somehow blend that junction and trans get rid of that indentation here. So there's a smooth transition between the lid and the cheek. So what our goal here is to remove the herni excess herniated fat and restore volume to that area in the infraorbital hollows. So I really think about patients as falling into three general category types. So the first category is a patient who has a lot of bulging of the fat and minimal hollowing. And in these patients, you can get away with just taking out fat and these patients will be happy. Now, the more common situation is that patients have some fat prolapse, but they also have a little bit of hollowing um, beneath, the, beneath the eyelids. And this, these patients benefit from having removal of the bulging fat, but also repositioning of that fat to fill the hollowing beneath that. And then finally, if a patient is mainly just lacking volume, you can think about mainly augmentation procedures to fill um, and restore volume. So again, let's start with some cases. This is again, a fairly senior patient who comes in bothered by the bags under her eyes, as well as ptosis. So she's interested in addressing the upper lids and the lower lids. And if you look here, um, she does have a little bit of brow ptosis, a little bit of extra skin here, and then prominent fat prolapse. So in my more senior patients, I generally tell them, you know, we should be a little bit more conservative. They tend to have more dry eyes. You don't want to, you don't want to do anything that would cause any worsening of the dry eyes. She's not particularly concerned about hollowing and, you know, volume loss because it's very natural and in patients in their eighth decade of life to have other types of you know, volumetric changes of their face. So she's not too concerned about hollowing. She just wants the bags gone, so to speak. And she does have some cheek deflation. So in her, what I did was just a simple blepharoplasty and ptosis repair. And I didn't try to get too fancy on the lower lids. I just took out fat. I actually didn't take off any skin whatsoever. Um, and you can see that the bags are gone as she requested here. Now we'll talk about the more common patient who is maybe in their middle aged uh, years. They're a little bit more sophisticated. They're this patient was bothered by the bags, the dark circles and the surface texture of the skin on the lower lids. Um, these patients tend to be ones who read a little bit more online about aesthetic rejuvenation. They may have had fillers before. Um, they understand the concept of hollowing and how volume restoration can um, improve the, the youthful appearance of the eyes. And they also may want some skin improvement at the same time. So this is the most common procedure that I do for, for lower blepharoplasty. In the US, there's a childhood story that's told to children called Robin Hood, where uh, Robin Hood and his band of thieves they would steal from the rich to give, and they would give it to the poor. And I like to use this concept to say, we should take the excess fat, but donate it to the areas that are lacking fat. And this results in blending the lid cheek junction. So this is a video showing um, a technique called fat repositioning. So here I've already opened the orbital septum, and these are pedicles of the medial and the central fat. And I'm actually redraping it you know, down below the orbital rim here. So you can see after I tie it off, it actually brings the, the fat down below the rim. Here again, I'm making a pedicle, making a short pass through the periosteum below the orbital rim, and then coming up and tying it off. And that redrapes and repositions the fat. 
So this patient underwent that procedure with a little bit of a skin pinch excision. And I typically redrape just the central and medial fat. I don't, tend, I don't like to redrape the lateral fat because it's oftentimes not necessary and patients are more bothered by fat prolapse laterally. And you can see there's a nice improvement in the blending of the lid cheek junction here. Now the last category of patient, um, oftentimes these are patients, again, in, who are middle aged or sometimes even younger, who um, are bothered by the tear trough hollows or the infraorbital grooves as we call them. So this patient came in complaining of a lot of dark circles and shadows beneath her eyes. And when you look over here, she said, well, can, it, can you just take out this fat for me? And what I said is, if I take out that fat for you, it's gonna be even further deflated over here. You'll still have that shadow, you'll still have that volume loss. And I don't think you'll look youthful and um, what you're hoping for. She also has deflation in the cheek here. You can see how sunken the cheeks look. And I kind of marked out the area here where I told her this is the area where I'd like to, you to have volume really restored. And I didn't think she had enough fat in the eyelid to fully volumize this area or that I could reposition that fat low enough to really restore her cheek volume. And so I took a slightly different approach here. This is a, a diagram showing what's called tear trough implants. So before we had the concept of fillers and fat transfer, uh, patients would sometimes have silicone implants put in the tear trough region to volumize that area. But now with the advent of fillers and fat transfer, we don't need to put silicone implants in patients' faces anymore. This can be restored through uh, less invasive um, mechanisms. So I'd like to introduce the concept of fat transfer for volumization. This is a technique that's more commonly used in general plastic surgery, and it can really use be to augment uh, volume on the face as well as in other parts of the body. So in this method, your fat is harvested via liposuction. I typically take fat from the flank region or the peri-umbilical abdominal region. The fat is then purified by centrifugation or filtration. And what this does is that it removes all of the, the, the ruptured fat cells that are non-viable, takes away the oils, the, the lidocaine, the blood in the lipoaspirate. And it really purifies the, the, the lipoaspirate so that you're left with just viable adipocytes and adipose derived stem cells, which can improve the skin quality. And then we transfer these into little syringes of fat here. So the general procedure for the harvesting and processing is I'll give the patients some nerve blocks um, on the face with just IV sedation. Then I infiltrate the abdominal region with tumescent anesthesia, which is a very dilute concentration, typically about 0.1% lidocaine. Oops, excuse me. I then do manual liposuction with a 10 cc syringe. And then I purify the fat via a closed system filtration over here where you can wash the fat in this bag uh, several times. You inject uh, balanced salt solution or saline and then you draw out the waste material here. So it takes out the, the saline, the blood, the lidocaine, the ruptured fat cells and that leaves you with um, nice one cc syringes that can be used for injection. So compared to off the shelf fillers, um, fat transfer is more durable because the fat is engrafted and it survives. It's more cost effective because you don't have to keep doing it as the body, like because the body breaks up filler. Um, there's lower risk of granulomas. There's no alloplastic implants. Um, in the Indian population with more pigmented skin, you don't have to worry about what's called the Tyndall effect. But in a fair skinned um, Caucasian population, you can sometimes have a bluish hue with certain types of fillers in the eyelid region. Um, and then it doesn't cause um, absorption of water like hyaluronic acid fillers can. So what are some of the dangers with fat, fat transfer? Well, it's the same ones that can occur with 
filler, you know, around the face. There's always a risk of intra-arterial injection, um, which can cause things like essential retinal artery occlusion or skin necrosis. Um, it's not easily dissolvable. So whereas we can use hyaluronidase to dissolve a, fill, a hyaluronic acid filler, you can't easily dissolve fat. Um, patients who are very thin with a lot of facial uh, volume loss with age tend to not have a lot of extra body fat for harvesting. And finally, uh, if a patient has had a lot of prior surgeries or scarring or radiation, there may be a disrupted blood supply that affects the, the success of survival of the fat. So this is that same patient here intraoperatively after I've already volumized and injected four cc of fat to the, the right side. And now you can see that blunt cannula entering through the cheek and I'm very carefully putting the fat into this area on the left side. And this is a patient after four cc's of fat to the right side and six cc's of fat to the left side. And you can see there's a little bit of undercorrection over here, but you can see there's a nice improvement in the eyelid and cheek volume. And I always tell patients I'd rather be conservative and undercorrect because I can always put a little bit of more fat or filler to touch things up, but it's difficult and you don't really wanna be in that position where you're trying to get rid of fat because sometimes that has to be done surgically. So in conclusion, the lower lids can age in very different ways over time. And you really wanna consider your patient's age, anatomy and aesthetic sensibility when you're customizing a procedure for them. You wanna be mindful of the concepts of fat herniation versus hollowing and the fat redraping technique can surgically address both things. However, extensive hollowing, certainly you should consider augmentation and either fat transfer or fillers. And I think the overall uh, slogan I have for these patients is excise, redrape, and or fill. Okay, so that wraps up the second part of the, my talk. So just when you're getting all excited to do lower blepharoplasty, we have to pause for a moment and say that you know, well, what are some of the bad things that can happen with this procedure? And if it's not done properly, you know, what are some of the ways that we can actually end up causing problems for patients? So this is the last segment of my lecture here. Our objectives are to talk about step-by-step -step this, how to do this procedure, as well as review some complications uh, Preoperatively, I like to mark out the fat pads of the, the eyelid and identify which are the areas that are most prominent and need debulking. I often like to mark out the infraorbital hollowing um, and where I want to redrape below that line. I start off the procedure with the limited canthotomy and cantholysis just to give myself more uh, working room to reposition fat. And when I do my canthotomy and cantholysis, I like to do just a conservative um, incision. I don't like to make overly large incisions which can disrupt the lateral canthal tendon. So here you can see the next step where I'm performing a transconjunctival incision. Um, I place a silk traction suture through the cut edge of the conjunctiva to put upward traction on the lower lid retractors. And then I use blunt dissection um, to dissect down to the orbital rim. This is a very gentle technique. It's not causing excessive cautery of the orbital septum and there's almost no bleeding. Next, uh, I open the orbital septum to allow the various fat pads to prolapse forward. Um, if you don't do this properly, it's hard to determine how much fat to take out. Up here, I'm extending that laterally to really open up the arcus, the la, open up the arcuate expansion of Lockwood's ligament. And here you can see that more pale colored medial fat pad. Here you can see I'm starting to conservatively debulk it. Um, you wanna be careful of the inferior oblique muscle which separates the medial and the central fat pad. And um, you also wanna make sure uh, not to leave too much lateral fat behind, which is a common mistake, not taking out enough of the lateral fat pad. 
Finally, after doing any fat repositioning or debulking, I like to place a single interrupted uh, suture to approximate the conjunctiva. Some people skip this step, but I think it's just a little bit more precise here. I oftentimes will give a little um, bit of steroid into the incision just to reduce the amount of postoperative inflammation. And then I oftentimes will do a little bit of a lid shortening procedure and then reform the lateral canthus. And then the final step is to do a little bit of skin excision if needed. Here you see, I just injected a little bit of local anesthetic um, that not only helps with hemostasis, but it helps give you a buffer to prevent over excision of skin. And here I've just crimped the skin with some non-tooth forceps and come across in subsidiary fashion. I do a little bit of light cautery to ensure hemostasis and then do a, a running closure from medial to lateral and trying to keep things nice and close to the lash line. You also don't want to extend this incision too far beyond the lateral canthus. Otherwise, you can have this happen. There's a patient who came into me bothered by this visible scar uh, beyond the canthus, uh, which happened due to the surgeon extending the incision too far. Uh, you don't want to do this, in, especially in a young patient with, with few wrinkles in this area. And this is an example of a patient before and after lower lid blepharoplasty with fat redraping and a skin pinch excision. You can see the mounds of fat are better, the skin is better, and it just looks a little bit more youthful, even though he's 76 years old. So let's talk about what happens in cases where things don't go as planned. And so this is a patient who came in with something what we call post blepharoplasty eyelid retraction, so PBER. But he is a 68 year old gentleman who had transcutaneous uh, blepharoplasty done by another surgeon. He presented with eyelid retraction, dry eyes, um, and was bothered by the scleral show here. So what are some of the risk factors for developing this? Uh, Dr. Mastry and colleagues did a nice paper a few years back looking at a consecutive series of patients who came into their practice from who had had blepharoplasty done elsewhere with this problem. And lo and behold, every single one of them had transcutaneous blepharoplasty where everything was done through a subciliary incision. Uh, and they also identified six risk factors for developing this. Um, weakness of the orbicularis muscle, um, overexcision of skin, so anterior lamellar shortage. Um, um, there was a volume deficit in the lower eyelid, meaning there's a lot of hollowing underneath with lack of support. Um, negative vector, meaning that their eye was relatively prominent in relation to their cheek with almost like some exophthalmos. Uh, and then also they had some pre-existing eyelid laxity that was, hadn't been corrected or um, excessive scarring due to cautery of the septum and the lower lid retractors. And based on how many of these findings they had, there is an increasing amount uh, in terms of scleral show. So what are some of the causes of this? Well, again, you know, it, it is certainly associated with the transcutaneous approach. Um, it's due to excessive cautery and scarring of a septum. Tether, you can get this by tethering the lower lid retractors or tethering the retractors while redraping the fat. And anybody who has pre-existing lid retraction or laxity or negative vector or heavy mid-face, these are all risk factors for developing this. Um, if it has occurred already, um, you can try to treat this by injecting 5-fluorouracil or steroids and doing surgery with spacer grafts or a mid-face lift and lid tightening procedures. But you know, better than you know, tr treating it after the fact is prevention. And some of the ways to prevent this is th using a transconjunctival approach with or without skin pinch, like I demonstrated, being conservative with your skin removal, if they have laxity already, you want to make sure you address that appropriately during surgery. And then if they need any additional preventive measures, like a mid facelift, that certainly helps to support the eyelid. So this patient um, had a, a alloplastic, a synthetic 
uh, eyelid spacer graft which made out of uh, porcine dermal collagen. So we didn't harvest from the mouth. And then I also tightened up the lid and did a mid-face lift. And you can see there's improvement in the scleral show in the lid position. There's another patient with the same technique, you know, developed this after her prior eyelid surgery. And then I put in a spacer graft, tightened the lid, did a mid-face lift. Other complications can be uh, residual fat prolapse um, that so not enough was taken out, taking out too much fat, um, which you can address with filler or fat transfer, um, lateral canthal scarring, which can be addressed with some laser resurfacing. You can get suture granulomas um, from redraping the fat if you use vicral suture, uh, and then post blepharoplasty atropion, which can occur if you don't do adequate lid tightening or if you take off too much skin. Um, just very briefly in the interest of time, you don't want to excise too much skin because that can cause cicatricial ectropion. And then if they do have laxity of the eyelid, you want to make sure you address it properly. If patients do have ectropion, you want to make sure you give it enough time because a lot of times this will improve on its own within the first three months. But if it doesn't, then you can fix it. This is a patient um, of mine actually, who after his blepharoplasty, he had a little bit of ectropion and you can see he's senior and I, maybe I didn't tighten it up enough on that on the right side. And then this is after further lid tightening, um, excision of some of the conjunctiva um, and reinserting the lower lid retractors. And you can see it flipped his eyelid inward, just like you would if you had a patient come in with senile ectropion. So I'll just skip the suture granulomas, but just to say that when you redrape, I no longer redrape with 5 vicrol because in a small subset of patients, they can develop these late granulomas even months after surgery. So now I use monofilament dissolvable sutures. Um, so in conclusion, you really want to use proper surgical technique to avoid these complications. You want to be mindful of who's at risk for eyelid retraction and ectropion and take measures to prevent that. Transconjunctival approach certainly helps reduce the risk of uh, eyelid retraction. And if it happens, you can use spacer grafts, lid tightening, and mid face lifts. And just be careful of vicral sutures when you're redraping fat. So I'd like to thank Dr. Jaya for the kind invitation. These are some pictures of us um, outside of the clinic during her observership here. And I want to say thank you to all of you and to stay healthy and best of luck um, as you begin to reopen next week. Thank you. That was an excellent overview, Dr. Lee. Uh, we have a few questions in the chat box. Can we go over to them? Yes, let's go to the chat. Okay, so our first question is, the orbital rim and the brow relation. So that's a great question. So what is the proper landmark for the brow? What is considered brow ptosis and what is not? So what I tell patients is that the, the bony prominence is called what I like to call the supraorbital ridge. And you can all put your finger up here and feel that bony prominence here. In men, the brow is, should be at the level of the orbital rim. And in women, it should be maybe just a little bit higher, especially on the tail of the brow above that bony prominence. So if you have a patient close their eyes to force them to relax their frontalis, then you can see where their brow is in relation to that bony prominence. If it's below, uh, then you know that they have brow ptosis. So another question, in the first patient, uh, residual difference in the two eyes, but, E-R-I-W better. Um, let me go back and take a look. I think it's, uh, but brow is better. Oh, the brow, but the brow is better. Um, let me go back here. So, I think what 85 year old, I, I, I'm not sh sure which 85 year old, maybe it was the first patient. The fifth patient, yeah. So I think, you know, I did excise a little bit of orbicularis muscle 
Um, like I talked about how if, if I see a patient with a little bit of lateral brow ptosis, I will excise some of the lateral orbicularis because I did go in and take skin. So I purposely took some muscle with it and that can give a subtle uh, brow lift. In certain aesthetic patients, we do what's called a chemical brow lift with Botox where we're, we're actually injecting Botox to the lateral orbicularis and that actually picks up the tail of the brow. So what I like to say is we're doing... Um, we're trying to achieve the same result surgically by weakening the orbicularis muscle laterally. Okay, let's go back to the chat here. Can you show some videos also? Okay, well, we already showed some videos. Um, no video. Okay, well, hopefully that addressed <laughs> your concern with the videos. Lower lid blepharoplasty, which approach do you prefer? I think we talked about it. I do prefer the transconjunctival approach as opposed to transcutaneous. What do you prefer in patients with anophthalmic socket with ptosis and dermatoshelasis? So, I mean, you can certainly fix ptosis, um, you know, in patients with the anophthalmic socket. What I will say, if you're asking about, do I prefer an anterior approach or a posterior approach, um, I think that both are reasonable, but if there's been, you know, shortening of the conjunctiva from the enucleation surgery or from other eye surgeries, you, you want to be careful not to further shorten the fornix. Uh, so in those types of patients who may have already had some conjunctival contraction or scarring, they would probably be be better candidates for an anterior approach so that you're not excising conjunctival tissue as you would with a conjunctival melarectomy surgery. Do I admit leprosy patients? No, all of my patients go home the very same day, whether they've had um, upper blepharoplasty or lid blepharoplasty. If they've had a facelift with blepharoplasty, they go home. If they've had orbital decompression surgery, they go home. Um, do you assess which patients are going to bleed and need admission? Well, we're very careful about this. And I always talk to patients about um, stopping blood thinners um, at least one week prior to surgery, ideally. Um, there are certain blood thinners that have a shorter half-life um, that can be stopped just two to three days prior. But, but absolutely, I I'm, I'm, take a lot of care to counsel patients appropriately. Again, I don't admit any patients for blepharoplasty. Um, if you do a transconjunctival approach, and there's that, you, if a patient were to have some oozing or bleeding, uh, there is an outlet for the, this to drain through the transconjunctival incision. I think you saw in the video that I only reapproximate the conjunctival incision with a single interrupted stitch. So if they did have some bleeding, it would drain out as opposed to have a retrobulbar hematoma. Uh, and then in the upper lids, if I do have patients who, like for example, are on warfarin and cannot stop it, I'll modify my technique. I'll just do a skin only excision. So I don't even open up the orbital septum and put them at risk for a, uh, a retrobulbar hemorrhage that way. And sometimes I'll even do the surgery entirely with uh, monopolar cautery. And then when you do that, there's almost no bleeding that happens afterwards. Another question, blepharoplasty, blepharochalasis, how do you treat this? Um, just skin excision. So if you're talking about, um, you know, true blepharochalasis um, as, a as opposed to, to uh, bluff dermatochalasis, I oftentimes will just do skin excision. But I did talk about how, in certain cases, I will take a little bit of, uh, of muscle. Now, if you're talking about you know, swelling of the eyelid, this is a little bit more of a tricky problem. And this can sometimes be treated with um, topical steroids uh, and sometimes even things like um, some diuretics can help as well. But I'm not sure if that's what you're talking about, but that's how I treat um, the swelling of the eyelid. Um, last question, for removal of the fat pad, do you make an incision from medial to lateral end of the fornix or just a small pocket? Uh, 
Great question. So I assume you're talking about lower blepharoplasty, and I typically like to do a, a transconjunctival incision across, you know, the lower lids because uh, I typically like to remove, you know, or re reposition medial and central fat, and it, and it's very important to take out the lateral fat. If you're talking about an upper blepharoplasty and whether you need to open the septum all the way across. If I'm not taking out preoponeurotic fat, then I only open the septum medially, take out medial fat prolapse, because like I said, a lot of times we want to preserve the preoponeurotic fat um, and not overly hollow them. And as you know, in the upper lid, there's no lateral fat pad in the upper lid. Uh, so typically we don't need to open the septum laterally. And do I prefer an Elman or blade for blepharoplasties? That's a great question. Um, in my practice, I typically use a uh, 15 blade to make the skin incisions, but I excise the skin with, um, with bovi cautery. And when I do this and have given enough time for the epinephrine to take effect, I really have minimal bleeding uh, with my upper blepharoplasty. Sometimes I literally you know, just excise the skin with bovi, uh, monopolar cautery, and I don't really need to do almost any additional cautery for hemostasis. So, but I do have colleagues who use Elmins or a CO2 laser, and they're, they're very happy with the results and they feel that it results in less bleeding. Um, there is sometimes additional setup or sometimes you know, additional equipment that's involved. And we have a question, can you explain how you handle significant male brow ptosis. So men typically have more brow ptosis because they have naturally lower set brows and uh, lateral brow ptosis can be very problematic in men. So for most of my patients who are, you know, more senior, have bushy eyebrows and are really looking for a more functional outcome, I, the easiest way to address this is with a direct brow lift where you remove a little strip of skin over the tail of the brow and that helps reposition the brow back so that it's at the level of the supraorbital ridge. Now, if a patient is more aesthetically inclined or, you know, doesn't have, uh, so if a patient is more aesthetically inclined and is interested in something that's really more of like a brow and forehead lift, then I do perform uh, endoscopic brow lifting or uh, pretracheal or trichophytic brow lifts where it's really like a upper third of the face lift <laughs> where you're raising the brows and forehead all together. Um, if they have really sparse brows and are really concerned about a, a brow scar that won't heal well or will be visible, then I will do an internal brow pexy like I often do for, for my female patients. But um, I generally tell them that it's not gonna be quite as durable as removing tissue in a direct brow lift. And then a question in fat aspirations, 10 millimeter syringe with what needle? So when I'm doing um, the liposuction, I actually don't use a needle, but I'm using a harvesting cannula. So these are special liposuction cannulas that you can think of it like a cheese grater. And every time you pass the cannula forwards and backwards, it's, it's harvesting and shaving off little tiny pieces of fat. So it's not a needle. How do you fix the fat with, with periosteum? Okay, I think this question is getting at how do you redrape the fat? So in the video I showed, I actually pedicalized the fat and took a little pass through the periosteum below the orbital rim. And I like to do this technique because you don't need to pass the sutures out through the skin. However, there is a technique that you know, some of my colleagues like to do, and I occasionally will do it as well, where you can take something like a, a double-armed proline suture um, and pass it out through the skin to reposition the fat. And you don't actually anchor anything to the periosteum, but you can create a subperiosteal dissection and there's a little bit of scarring and adhesions that form and that so that once you take this out, the fat remains in position or theoretically 
remains fixed. I just like the passing through the periosteum and keeping the stitches internalized because I think there's a little bit more precision and you don't have these stitches that are coming out of the eyelid for the first week. And then also I think the dissolvable suture gives a little bit of inflammation and makes sure that the fat pads don't retract prematurely before it's fixed into place. Do we have any other questions? Um, what suture you, do you generally use, uh, Brad? Yeah, I typically use a 5-0 monocryl suture. So monocryl is a, a monofilament dissolvable suture, and it's very non-inflammatory uh, as compared to Vicryl. So I, I definitely switch. I used to do 5-0 Vicryl, and I've switched entirely now to monofilament. We have one more. We believe yeah. in fat rejuvenation of the face. Uh, yes, absolutely. It works very well for the face. So um, I think today's talk was mainly focused on eyelids, but I, I've given other lectures about how the face ages, and you can certainly have loss of volume in the temples, in the superior sulcus region, and below the eyes and the cheeks. Um, you can use it to address um, nasal labial folds cheek deflation in the buccal fat area. And when you harvest and prepare your fat, you can certainly revolumize all of these areas of the face. So if I'm doing a pan facial rejuvenation with fat, sometimes I'll literally purify about 30 to 50 cc's of fat and inject it all over the face. And if, you're, if you have experience with filler, you would never inject a face with 30 to 50 cc's of filler because it swells up and you know, it gives you a much higher volumetric yield. But with fat, I normally tell patients about maybe 70% will survive, not all of it will stay. Um, and you can't think of it in the quantities that you would for a hyaluronic acid filler. Stem cells for fat, does it result in a younger face? Um, yes, there has been some studies looking at this. The lipoaspirate is rich in uh, mesenchymal stem cells, which are the adipose-derived adipo 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 stem cells. And this can be further enhanced through centrifugation um, and where you take and enrich what's called the stromal vascular fraction, which is one of the layers that layers out after centrifugation. And these stem cells certainly can help to rejuvenate the face beyond and the skin quality beyond what volumization does to rejuvenate the face. And there's also various types of uh, growth factors in the lipoaspirate as well. And some of you may have heard of things like PRP, which is platelet rich plasma. In PRP, there's no viable stem cell, there's no viable adipocytes. It's just, you know, growth factors uh, and platelets. And this generally doesn't volumize the, the face, but it does improve the skin quality and skin texture, and that can be um, rejuvenating as well. Okay, we have more questions coming in. So for a lateral tarsal strip, that when you're tightening the lid, what suture do you prefer? Um, I typically do like to use um, vicryl sutures. Uh, but even in some of my elderly patients with thin skin, occasionally they will develop a suture granuloma. And so sometimes I'll also use things that like uh, mersaline suture. I don't, most of my friends overseas don't carry or use mersaline, but mersaline is a non-dissolvable braided suture. And I find it tends to be a little bit less inflammatory as compared to Vicryl. But you know, you could use something. You could you could use a monofilament suture like a, a proline or something else. But I think that Vicryl does give a little bit more inflammation, which is helpful sometimes because it really causes that scarring and helps it to fixate, you know, through that inflammation. And then there's a question about any personal experience with uh, do's and don'ts 
for stem cells from fat. Um, I mean, I typically don't do stem cells for just the sake of stem cells. I'm typically doing it in the context of fat transfer and facial augmentation. Um, but in terms of pearls, I mean, one of the things is to be conservative and talk to patients and say, you know, look, we can always do more rounds of fat transfer, but you know, you don't, we don't want to be going back and trying to dissolve fat, which is not easy to do. And we don't certainly don't want to have to go back and cut surgically cut out fat. So I, I tell patients it's better to have a little bit of an undercorrection and be able to go back and do a, another session if needed. And that's not considered a failure. It's considered, you know, a, a staged uh, treatment program, you know, something that can be repeated as needed. Okay, uh, that was an excellent presentation, Brad. Thank you so much. It okay, thank you so much for, for inviting me. It was a pleasure being with you all. And if you have any uh, questions, um, you can certainly email me. I'm happy to, to take any questions. My email address is B-L-E-E, -E, like my last name. So B Lee at miami.edu, or you can talk to Dr. Jaya and she'll be happy to put you in touch with me. That's so great. thank you. Stay healthy, stay well, and uh, best of luck as you guys move forward, you know, with reopening next week. Thank you so much. See you. Okay. Take care. Bye-bye.